I saw a list uh, of projects and threads. So let's just quickly go through it to just make sure everybody has a team and quickly walk through what we expect to do. Uh, is the list on uh, Slack, Hope? Or I can just do Discord because I know there was a... Uh, okay, and I counted uh, the number of people uh, there's roughly around 24 people listed. So everybody here has a name on the projects. Yes, that means you all have teams. Okay. Yeah. Even if you don't have projects, you must have teams. Because then you can figure out what you want to do. But if you don't have a team, then we kind of it becomes a problem. Uh, is that true for everybody online? Uh, that you all have listed your name on, uh, and I'll just share this for a second. Uh, you all have listed your name at least on one team here. And it's perfectly okay if you're the only one. Uh, and I think, uh, Mrinal, I was thinking about it. Did we list anything on malaria here at all? Oh, I don't think so, Manu. I haven't seen anything. Oh, Mrinal, I don't think we can hear you. Sorry, it's on our end. Let's we'll fix that on our end. I think you are unmuted. So can you hear me now? Uh Yeah, can you say something now, Mrinal? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, still no sound. Sorry. Uh, just give us two seconds. Uh, I'll come back to you. Okay, so uh, sure. I'm just going to go through titles here and talk a little bit about uh, what you should all do uh, to make sure that you have... Uh... Oh, what just happened there? Oh, this is you guys. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, just a little bit on what you need to do uh, to make sure that there is enough documentation for your projects, because some of them just have a little line and a sentence, uh, and for design meetings that we'll do. So obviously, you want to do by the numbers for every one of your the project that you've chosen, and you want to do a very detailed Fred Park. Uh, has anybody done that yet for their projects? Is there any Fred Park that I could look at? Uh, anybody online has done a detailed Fred Park for the projects that you guys are all now choosing? I think Shuzo has uh, a I'm not, Oh, one. Tanvi raised her hand. We're I still think, working on audio. Oh, sorry. I think Shuzo has a pretty comprehensive audio. It's one. It's okay. We can hear it. And I can repeat. Just, uh, oh, I was oh, just saying. Yeah, I thought this is great. Was... Yeah, go ahead, Tanvi. I thought Shuzo's Fred Park for the invasive species monitoring was pretty comprehensive. Okay, can I open it up? Uh, I just want to take a look to see, oh, right here. Uh, so I think the way we should do this is in the document itself, just link your Fred Park and by the numbers. Uh, and I'm just going to open this right now. Uh, this is what gets me excited. Uh, okay. So uh, let's just walk through it in some sense. And again, I think uh, let's try doing this sooner rather than later, uh, because uh, when we do our sit down one on one meetings, when you are sitting together amongst each other, uh, you need to have a document that you can go back to. You know, a lot of ideas and threads will come about. Uh, and I think without having a document, it's very difficult to make design decisions. Uh, and effectively, one way you could do it is, for example, in Tanvi, in your team uh, on the invasive monitoring, I see at least four people. And so several of you could uh, independently you know, build Fred Parks and join them. You can be thinking about, oh, why don't we assign sets of people uh, to do certain kinds of uh, 
rough analysis that we might actually be interested in in terms of uh, each of the functional requirements. Uh, and then I think I'm assuming, have you guys really uh, con converged on crayfish? There are kids joining the class today, which is always good. Uh, uh, yeah. Sachi, can you mute yourself? Uh, so Tanvi, can you say a word or two? Have you guys converged or are you guys thinking of doing multiple uh, systems for monitoring? I think we still need to t get together as a group and talk. Um, I only started talking to them, like I only like reached out to them I, um, a couple of days ago. So okay. yeah. But but the goal is to really do red swamp crayfish, right? I think that was what Shuza was thinking. But yeah, I'm yeah. Not sure. and I think this is useful. Uh, it's ambitious to then have multiple sets of projects. If there is enough cohesion in your team, try doing one project. Uh, so I think looking through, anybody wants to kind of uh, comment or walk through uh, what might be the next thing that comes on your plate in terms of trying to transition uh, what uh, the, the key and the hard part is transitioning to prototyping something, right? So you'll be able to put a ton of ideas on a piece of paper and then the tough thing is, what can I actually do that helps me uh, choose uh, an approach or not? So, uh, for example, in this case, I'm curious uh, for your team, uh, have people talked a little bit about what could you do as an immediate next step uh, in trying uh, what is effectively the analysis column? I think up till now we have talked a lot about this. Uh, we really haven't jumped in into uh, analysis. So I'm curious, uh, what immediate things, sets of resources that you've already seen in the class, stuff that you can build upon? Uh, are there sets of low-hanging fruits that you might think about to just say, oh, this approach works or doesn't work? Is there a kind of a discussion you guys have had? Um. No, I, again, not to the best of my knowledge. I think I'm, I just thought it was a good Fred Park. I don't think I know as much about the project team yet, but I'm excited to learn more. Yeah. And I I think I'm, had, I'm, had, had I'm curious if, uh, uh, I'm wondering if Shoju is online. Uh, I don't see him here. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll just make a few sets of comments. And I think this is uh, an important aspect of using this documentation. Uh, the first thing to think a little bit about is can you anchor yourself <laughs> in a place? Uh, Ibrahim, can you mute yourself? Otherwise, I will mute you. There we go. Uh, you might want to find a location where you can map the problem. So it would be useful to know and see whether either locally here in California, we have red swamp crayfish, or another proxy species, for example, that every team member has access to. Uh, it just sort of anchors you in some sense. It makes you makes the problem visceral. So, you know, from a context of uh, the bags that we were talking about, it might just become so obvious to say, oh, can I get my hands on a commercial available product that I can literally hold in my hand? Uh, that might be a fair thing to do just to you have you're anchoring yourself in something. So that's, uh, it might turn out that uh, you don't have that specific sets of species, and then you might go after uh, something that's a proxy, something that is quite abundant, something that's roughly the same size, might be in that same kind of an ecosystem to just say, uh, could I use something else as a proxy? Because if you don't have uh, anchored into a specific, sample, it's very hard to actually validate and test anything. So if you're working on diagnostics, it's often the first thing you look for, do I even have access to any samples? Or can I make proxy samples? Because any approach that you would need, you need to validate it with something. Uh, so I think uh, same applies for thinking about uh, many of the projects. So you know, some of you have been talking about microplastics. Very easy to make a microplastic sample. 
uh, right? You could take uh, you could take uh, things that generate microplastics. We have standard beads in the lab, for example. You can validate and put them in different concentrations and say, okay, I do have something I'm anchoring on. Uh, so that's one thing that I would like everybody to do in uh, the sets of Fred Park is for the class of experiments, you really have a very clear idea of whichever approach that you're taking, this is how we would validate it. Uh, I think, you know, there was a set of a discussion around uh, uh, heavy metal contaminants. Uh, there are multiple sets of proxies around that, uh, even if you don't actually use the one that might be uh, dangerous to handle, for example. So certain sets of lead contaminants and other things are tricky to handle, but there are also proxies available for it uh, before you get into really just actually working with the sample you might be interested in. The same thing goes for most infectious diseases. Uh, if somebody picks up malaria, we have mice malaria in the lab. We have many different types of malaria that's not infectious to humans, uh, but you can still work and test along the way. So I think uh, keep this in mind of finding a proxy that's associated to your product. Uh, the second thing I would do immediately, and I'm just saying literally in uh, the, this week itself, uh, is any approaches that we have already talked about that are tangibly on the table, test it. So uh, for this project specifically, planktoscope would be an obvious place to start. If it turns out crayfish do have larvae, and if you know the rough size and form factor, do a quick test. Uh, get to a point where something that might be readily available could actually be tested for your water filters for what would you think about what is readily available that you could test? No. Uh -huh. But what do you get your hands on like tomorrow? That's it. So, you know, they, they are, there is a commercially available product. And you can think about just understanding that much better. I think what I'm trying to say is the class will remain more of a conceptual sit back and think kind of a class unless you take that approach and say, hey, I'm going to go to Home Depot tomorrow. I'm going to walk around and see what is the object that fits in my dream or a vision that I have. And, you know, there's nothing that I can do. I mean, of course, once you kind of get in that started, we can support you, but it's very important to make sure there is funds assigned to every team. You guys have to tell me, what do you need? Uh, we can assign those sets of funds. Make sure that you have materials. In the lab, you can figure out, we can assign sets of plastic boxes where your supplies for the quarter will remain. Uh, but this is much more on the execution side because otherwise we'll be sitting in design meetings. We'll have all of these very nice, things on a piece of paper, but you cannot make critical design decisions unless you've played around with stuff. Uh, so, you know, I think for every project, we can do something like this, uh, where at the end of the class, I'll end a little bit early, say around 1030, uh, and then just go through with all of you uh, to just make sure that all of you feel what is the most tangible object you want to get started. Uh, so we'll do that after what I want to cover today. And uh, is there anybody in the class who doesn't as yet have a very tangible project? I think the only comment that I had made online was on this biomimicry project, which it was uh, too broad, too ill-defined. So it would be valuable, Rashi, Divyanshi, and Tanvi, to explicitly either choose an approach or a problem, uh, but make sure that you make that problem statement very, very clear. Uh, I think everything else to me look like uh, uh, it's tangible. Uh, anybody has uh, questions or uh, worries around kind of projects, project teams? Uh, I know some of you are in single people teams. So see if you can recruit somebody, otherwise it's perfectly okay uh, to be one people teams, as long as you're excited about the idea that you're actually pursuing. Um, 
Okay, any questions on, uh, okay, I see the microplastics team is uh, big, which is good, you know, it's a big, it's a big project. Uh, one comment that I would make is, uh, as you are choosing, expand your horizon, if it's going to be a big team, you can choose subsets or two different approaches to actually test. So uh, this is all I wanna say around this. Uh, there is an announcement that I also want to make, uh, which is useful for everybody. Uh, I just announced this on, uh, this is really funding post the class. Uh, and uh, I have been for a while uh, excited about uh, making sure that we can continue uh, projects beyond the class because uh, lots of projects uh, continue. And so it so happens that we were able to wrangle up some funds. So there's, you know, if you needed yet another incentive, of course, uh, these sets of funds are not just uh, for participants in the class. Uh, but you can go on this link. I'll post this on Discord, or I already did. Uh, uh, the due date for this is around 15th March, I think. Uh, this is roughly around $100,000. Uh, so this is a significant amount of money. It will, of course, be split between 10-ish uh, or so projects that I'm thinking about. Uh, but the idea is uh, that this will be an open competition. Of course, all of you get to participate. Uh, but anybody else who wants to engage can participate itself. So the deadline for this is March 18. Uh, one of the things that I want to see, at least from all of you, uh, is some amount of progress made on tangible things. So what is literally accessible to you, crack that open, play with it, build. And we will talk through a little bit on this explicitly on the... Uh, kind of just sit down design sessions itself. Uh, but one of the key goals uh, to sort of differentiate yourself is a little bit around starting to make progress and kind of going beyond where, you know, I you have a tangible feeling about one solution or one class of solutions uh, that are feasible. So that's something that you can only do through this column uh, and then just keep this in mind. This is uh, March 18th as a deadline. Uh, I can't do anything about the deadline because uh, the funding bodies dictate that. So unlike a lot of class assignment deadlines, this is not negotiable. If you don't get your proposal in by that date, uh, you can't be considered for uh, that specific funding route. Uh, um, sorry, yeah. do you Go mind ahead. talking about what exactly this funding supports? Like what? I think uh, the the idea, I've been trying to find funds to support uh, broader projects in frugal science. Uh, the initial thread was really around, for a lot of our past projects, we have scaled them up, and it's been hard to find funding separately for each one of the projects. So now I have some pool of funding that broadly applies to it. Uh, it's effectively an open call. Uh, for projects that use a uh, kind of a frugal science framework to crack uh, problems in education, health, and environment. So it couldn't be more broad. It's as broad as possible. Every single project here is applicable. Uh, I think the framing is that I care about scale. So you have to have an approach that will scale uh, from a global context at least on a piece of paper, you have to convince uh, that if that approach uh, works and you demonstrate it works, uh, it has a potential to scale. So, uh, you know, I think it's uh, lots of time you start projects and then you get stuck because you can't find sets of resources. Uh, now the tables are a little bit turned around. Uh, lots of people are excited to support ideas uh, but it's very important that you actually deeply care. This is not just a casual thing that you do on the side. It really is something that you make, put time and effort in. Uh, and again, you know, it's uh, it's perfectly okay It's uh, if you're doing it just for a kind of a class. But I know for many of you, the projects that you all are choosing is something that you've been thinking about for a while. 
and will be a significant portion of your time. So it, it does matter uh, if you want to pick that up and take that as an opportunity. So uh, the that that funding call is open to anybody and everybody, not just this class. I want to be very clear. It just so happens that uh, the class is running exactly at the same time. It's open to all participants from past classes. It's open to anybody who uh, cares and thinks about this framework and wants to apply. Uh, okay, I think that's all I want to say around projects. Uh, and maybe around 10.30, I'll switch and sit down with a few of you, uh, especially the larger teams, because then I can find you all in a bigger group. And if it's one-on-ones, then it's easy. Uh, we can do that separately. But I think when there are more number of people involved, so I'll kind of prioritize the groups that are uh, uh, larger in some sense uh, for one-on-one -on -one sit downs. Uh, please try filling out the Fred Park uh, and the by the numbers uh, before we do kind of our sit down. So maybe around Thursday or before Thursday, at least for a project, uh, have something because then we can poke holes at it. We can, uh, you know, try to see whether that's sufficient or not. Uh, any questions so far? Then I'm going to transition to just diagnostics, things that I wanted to cover. No. Nope. Uh, Hope, do you know the logistics of finding bins and having team bins? I see lots of team bins with lots of random stuff. Uh, do we have access to bins? Yeah, can you ask Ross or Mong and just figure out, just so if you need storage, there's storage here. Uh, are and Is anybody trained in the shop next door or no, right? I see. And is anybody here? trained in PRL, by the way, one or two people. Uh, I think, tell us what kind of uh, space and things you might need. Uh, any sets of, make a list of like, oh, it would be nice to have access to a laser cutter. We can make all of that accessible just on a team by team basis. Uh, it's going to be very specific. The fabrication facilities on campus are just spread across. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we have in our shop that I'm happy to train you guys on. That's our internal shop that does require a level of rigor and good policy and uh, usage. Uh, similarly, I think the folks that are online, uh, there are a couple of locations and fab labs that are fairly easy for us to get you guys access to. Uh, just write to us and say, uh, here is the kind of tools that would be valuable to have. And then I'll work on thinking about, I think, Ashoka, for example, is a fairly straightforward one. Uh, but for several of the other folks, it might become useful. Uh, if uh, you don't have any access, uh, then uh, we will see in the network uh, if we can get you some access for some physical space. Uh, OK, I think uh, let's switch to uh, diagnostics a little bit. Uh, and a comment uh, before we start is uh, what happened? Uh, did you guys build a SnapDX unit uh, Friday? Yeah. Uh, did people build it collectively or no? Did everybody actually make one? OK, that's awesome. Yeah, and uh, they looked OK. Awesome. OK. Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the threads around, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this on the manufacturing side. Uh, lots of parts in the object that you put together are custom built. So we did a lot of injection molding, but there's a lot of parts that we borrowed from things that just exist very naturally that are in the production line itself, so we don't have to make it. And this is what I meant, that when the time comes, you have to just go to a hardware store look at a column of what's available and say, hey, this is what I want to build. And here are certain sets of things that I can put together. Uh, even for a large class of projects, uh, before you do all custom fabrication, the first sets of prototypes should just be from materials that you find. Uh, let's just briefly talk about, because I don't think I spent enough time on the diagnostics framework. And I want to end the paper conversation uh, so there is this classic, 
assured criteria that we had discussed in diagnostics. And one of the fun things that a lot of people have been thinking about, I think this vision has not come true as yet, uh, but that a figure that I like to think a little bit about in this uh, context is just how far have people been thinking about paper diagnostics? Uh, and, you know, in some sense, one of the interesting things that just has come online for the longest time now, for maybe 10 years or so, is flexible electronics. Uh, it's actually fairly feasible to now print electronics on paper itself. So most RFID tags that you guys use, uh, for example, in your books, if you wanna walk out with a book that has not been checked out of a library, don't do that. Uh, it rings, right? Why does it ring? Uh, you guys know what, what's behind? Uh, there are two completely separate sets of ways, but there is something in the book that can be detected when you walk out. Nobody has held the RFID tag in their hand here. You guys know what RFID tag is? No? That's the classic example of paper electronics. It's a little tag that looks like an antenna, and unfortunately, actually, yeah, the one on, up on top. That's where this paper electronics really got scaled up, where it's literally printing either silver and copper inks on a piece of paper as an antenna. There's actually also a chip on it. It has no batteries. It takes RF energy from outside, another antenna, which is large. It charges the chip. It runs a certain compute cycle, say, give its ID, and it emits and transmits all without a battery. So literally one ASIC chip and a tag, and it's, of course, a disposable tag, so the cost of every tag can be in pennies. So although it's been used in retail industry for a while, you can imagine all kinds of medical applications when you're trying to track sets of things. Uh, and so, you know, again, one of the things is that in that space, it's been very widely used, although uh, it hasn't, I haven't seen a true diagnostics application uh, where it's been applied. But some amount of electronics it's fairly easy to incorporate if you're really thinking about uh, readout, for example, which is one of the hardest challenges in most diagnostics, quantitative readout. Uh, yeah, if people haven't picked up RFID tags, maybe this uh, Friday, I'll bring some tags. You guys can dismantle them. Uh, it's fairly simple to make. Uh, there is a very straightforward process. Screen printing, everybody's printed a T-shirt here before. Yes? Uh, so screen printing, you might think is, actually it goes down to uh, tens of microns. Uh, so you can get screen printing resolution that's quite remarkable, and it's very useful to be able to print certain sets of uh, uh, processes, even with very, very simple tools, for example. So I think uh, it would be useful, uh, there's another technique that's used in uh, using craft cutters to make these sets of printed boards itself. But effectively, uh, the combination of electronics and readout is a fairly open space in diagnostics, uh, especially in terms of if you want that readout to be ultra cheap. Uh, the other side of this story is, uh, you know, lots of folks have been implementing readout just using cell phones. And, you know, so of course, there's a massive space there. We've used something like that in the past. Uh, uh, there is a very large space in electrochemistry. Uh, lots of electrochemistry can now be done on these sets of printed sets of scenarios. Uh, and kind of, you know, I think one of the, the fun vision that this uh, broader range of thing talks about is this idea of integrated fluidics, integrated electronics, some amount of readout and some amount of transmission of that information to another uh, device all on a kind of hardware that's effectively disposable. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that is, uh, I think the environmental challenge on diagnostics and especially use and throw diagnostics is a pretty tough one. Uh, there's only two companies that I know currently that do have a RDT in the market that is completely degradable. 
So made out of uh, the kinds of plastics that we use in the compost, for example, when you go to Cooper Cafe. Uh, and can you think of a reason? Why is it that the diagnostics industry might not have adopted uh, the kind of standards that you might think about in terms, because every RDT, every COVID test that you run uh, does get, go into a landfill eventually. And we do make hundreds of millions of them for all kinds of diseases. Might there be a reason that that transition hasn't happened? Yeah. So cost is, of course, one, because you're really trying to reduce cost per test to begin with. Uh, but the second side of that story is, uh, which is really where diagnostics is very specific, healthcare products are very specific, that you cannot either compromise the quality or risk to a patient, right? So this is why, unlike many other things where you could make a transition very quickly, uh, and many a times, I think one of the realizations that we have made is for a lot of biomaterials, we don't have the specs. So they have never even been tested for the range of temperatures and humidity or the kind of performance that you might be looking for. I'll talk about molecular tests and I'll show you this massive panel of hundreds of materials that we tested to make sure that they don't leach out an unknown ion or an unknown chemical that will completely ruin your test or will be uh, allergic to a human, for example. So, you know, it's a moving target uh, and primarily because data doesn't exist for many of these types of materials, it gets harder for a designer to incorporate them. While the classic plastics, there's just a ton of data, every possible thing that you might imagine. And a couple of years ago, a team in the class essentially started building a kind of a community database uh, there is another project that's doing something similar. It's called Materialome, which is kind of the materials genome. Uh, and people try to put in a distributed manner all kinds of materials. So as you're starting to think about what are you gonna make your stuff out of, try taking a look at some of these databases because the choice that you might make early on, you'll stuck with, and again, you know, most of you have seen the Abbott COVID test that is actually made of paper. So that's one example. Although they have reduced plastic in the total amount, there is still a little bit plastic in there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think most of the time uh, there is a boundary between what is considered uh, uh, something that can transmit. I think in the end, if it has an infectious agent, it should be collected. But as test moves to at home, uh, some of those boundaries change because the first person getting exposed to it. So needles, for example, they are always a very high risk. That's a massive space that we really haven't cracked. And even lancets, for example, to a certain extent, there's a now there are certain sets of designs that are out there, uh, but any needles that have been exposed to in the past uh, is really to be collected in biohazard. Uh, I would say that's an open problem. You can think about if you were making things out of degradable materials, either incineration or other ways. I just came back from a surgery meeting. Uh, it was a global health surgery meeting uh, on campus uh, with participants from around the world. And I mean, I'll talk about surgery in another uh, class, but the amount of waste coming out of a hospital is astronomical, both from a cost perspective, but also just how do you even handle it? And how do you handle the supply chain associated with it? And the better you want to build your practices, the more, unfortunately, you end up in this cycle of one time use and throw away. So I think, I mean, diagnostics, it's actually a smaller problem uh, because the sample is contained to a certain extent uh, and you could design around it. So I think this is something that you should think about if anybody's picking up a di Like we will, I know there is a urine project, for example. Uh, you know, blood is a pretty high 
uh, from an infectivity, just because viruses and unknown viruses, uh, they live for a very long while. Uh, stool samples, urine samples are also, when you discard it, you can't just dump them in any traditional uh, streams. Uh, they really have to be collected in a way. Uh, you could think about classic, uh, what we often do with chemical lysis. So we'll talk a little bit about that, that there are chemicals that you can use that really do lyse whatever might be living, including viruses. Uh, there is a heat inactivation is another trick that's used in most diagnostics. So I think, hope. what's the number? 95C for five minutes? Yeah, is a CDC standard that you can do as an inactivation. And then once it's, the sample is inactivated, the object becomes disposable in a way. Uh, I think kind of the, the thing that I wanted to mention here before we jump into what we'll talk about is uh, I've enjoyed, you know, I think uh, there are fundamental limitations around this, uh, but it is important. The only thing I want you all to kind of think about this is not the word paper. That's not so important because just certain types of functions you just can't implement. Uh, but the important thing to remember is the materials that you choose will dramatically change uh, the directions of what you can actually do. And it will come back to bite you. And that really is kind of one of the stories of, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about SnapDX, that the choice of those materials have to be made very, very carefully early on, uh, especially because your uh, design might actually be dependent on those material properties. Uh, so since we brought up the e-waste side of the story, I wanna show you guys this one picture. Uh, so I think we've talked about accessibility of diagnostics, but uh, this is something that I found uh, quite horrendous. Another, if somebody wants to think about this as a project idea, I was just looking at the amount of uh, use and throw electronics in our society at this point. Uh, and the numbers that I was able to find is for uh, electronic uh, vaping. So you've all seen the trend around vaping. There's all kinds of problems that we can talk about it. Uh, but one obvious thing is that there has been a rise of these uh, use and throw vaping e-disposable cigarettes. Uh, and uh, there is actually lithium batteries. There's all kinds of materials in it that then just go into the waste stream. And as the trend increases and people are able to reduce some of the manufacturing cost, uh, because there is no cost on an environmental disposal, you end up in this situation that, you know, uh, this was a su survey primarily done in the UK uh, and the numbers are actually quite tricky, uh, especially just because, I mean, just for lithium alone itself, it's a, it's a big uh, issue. And again, uh, technically, you're not supposed to dispose them, but when you kind of start building sets of products around that space, uh, suddenly they go into waste streams that you didn't design them to go on. Uh, so I think uh, it would be a fun, if somebody is interested in lithium batteries, uh, it's kind of a phenomenal space to look into and to see what's happening uh, currently in that space. Uh, and especially, again, uh, uh, the, the disposability is a really tough, uh, kind of a nut to crack because in a health product, you are looking for a given amount of performance. So I'm going to go back to kind of uh, what, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this or talked about this for a little bit. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've been thinking about this general idea, which is, can you do diagnostics under a tree? Uh, I didn't coin this phrase. Uh, this was something that uh, someone told me uh, uh, this is a friend uh, I met in Uganda. Uh, I was, uh, this was almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and one of the things was he was a pathologist who'd been working and training people for the last 30 years on malaria microscopy. Uh, and he had this kind of a quote. Uh, this was around uh, 2013, 2012. Uh, and we were just starting to think a little bit about scale of sets of projects that we are we now do. And one of the comments that he made is, Manu, you should come back when you can do diagnostics under a tree. And I just, it stuck with me. And uh, I didn't understand it at that time as the most wise things that are told to you. 
at that moment, you're like, yeah, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, but I think now more and more, you know, we've traveled as a lab. We've spent a lot of time in the field. Hope and I got the chance to go to Liberia sometime. Maybe we can talk just about Liberia alone, actually. That might be a fun thread to do. And to just give you a context of the breadth of problems that we're not even thinking and talking about right now. Uh, but the project that I'm talking about is very relevant in that space. So, you know, context is important. It gives you this perspective. Uh, and I think we've taken a little bit of this to heart is to say, how do you bring diagnostics out of centralized lab facilities? The point I'm making is I'm not saying that centralized lab facilities are not important. Quest diagnostics and entities like that will forever be embedded in the classic urban infrastructure for health because it's convenient, it scales, uh, this idea of collecting samples and getting them in centralized facilities and rapidly delivering an answer works for certain class of problems. But for certain other class of problems, you have to flip and you have to build an infrastructure that is as much in people's homes as you could imagine. Uh, and so I think there is a trade-off between this. You can choose, I saw there was somebody had a comment around breast cancer screening. You have to ask yourself a question. You wanna build it in a centralized manner with lots of high throughput, uh, and then you can scale up on the technology level or something that you wanna be able to screen people in their homes or in places where there might not be a traditional hospital per se. Uh, I think, uh, some of the unusual things in this is, uh, uh, this is actually a tool that we built uh, uh, that's in Cameroon uh, for diagnostics for uh, onchocerciasis. Uh, this is basically river blindness. There are these nodules that appear on your skin, uh, but the challenge is that you don't know whether there is a live parasite living right under your skin. Uh, so it's a little bit scary. Uh, they do actually, in certain sets of stages, show up in people's eyes. This is why people get blind. Uh, I don't know if some of you know these stories from Zaire, where massive sets of populations, everybody that was right next to the river went blind. And at that time, we didn't understand this transmission sets of cycles. And then it realized it was these black sand flies. The black flies live in the river. They transmit. And so one of the threads around there is... Uh, We've been exploring an idea of how to use uh, capacitive signatures completely non-invasively to tell whether there is something uh, parasitic living right under your skin. Uh, so another kind of, I'm tossing out an idea for a project. We've worked quite a lot on that, but I think there's a lot more to be done. Uh, some of uh, this is Madagascar, and I think I'll talk a little bit about Madagascar, but again, the average statistics of what I had mentioned to you all before, uh, some of the clinics that we directly have worked in are roughly around 12 to 14 hours on foot. So this is what I mean when I say uh, diagnostics under a tree, uh, that a significant portion of people, the healthcare that they could receive in an extreme kind of an environment is the only option that they have, just in terms of thinking about 10 to 12 hours from a traditional health facility. So it kind of, uh, it begs this question of what class of technologies could we take outside a clinical setting and bring them in health of community health workers? And so I think much of the comments that I'm making here are really applicable to community health workers. And there is a question around this. People often associate, oh, simple things like taking weight of a person a community health worker could do uh, if there is a very directed questionnaire, they can ask that. But there is a shifting conversation because we don't have any other infrastructure. How do you bring capabilities and capacities to community health workers without burdening them to such an extent that they cannot function at all? Because you can also overdo it and realize that suddenly a community health worker that's visiting 30, 40 homes per day is just like, oh, you want them to take blood pressure and other non-communicable diseases data. So there is a fine balance and kind of the framework that we've been thinking about from a technology point of view is, is there a sweet spot, uh, but also trusting our community health networks to enable for them to do more. That's really kind of the reality of the situation. 
if you had all sets of resources, you would think differently. Uh, but the reality is that this is the primary layer of care that most people receive uh, in a scenario where resources are limited. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have seen kind of what does a community health worker uh, actually look like? Uh, this is India. So this is an ASHA worker. It's one of the largest workforce, medical workforce in the world. Uh, it's, uh, you can get trained as a health worker. It doesn't, uh, there are certain sets of uh, kind of traditional ways, but many people actually stumble upon this. Uh, you basically arrive with whatever you need. So that's kind of one of the scenarios is uh, imagine just a backpack that a health worker is carrying. And so a set of products that at least we've been thinking about in this framework is what has to fit in this backpack. That's it. And so when you arrive, you are the sole uh, uh, healthcare provider. And then of course, medicine and medicine delivery has been quite a big part. So malaria, for example, most malaria cases are treated by community health workers where on either an RDT turning positive they give them a test. So diagnostics and pairing of drugs has really been one of the key pillars for most infectious diseases. Uh, and we do have drug candidates that you can deliver and give, but what is not okay is to treat somebody without a diagnosis. Diagnose. And again, you know, clinical diagnosis is very, very hard. So that doesn't work in a healthcare setting because then it's a judgment call and that starts to break down. So WHO has a standard where they often say that uh, you know, for most infectious diseases, their mandate is that there should be a diagnostic test. But the reality is, of course, majority, even for malaria, majority drugs are given without any diagnosis. Yes, late. Yeah, I think I, I'm a strong believer that diagnostics is what is lagging behind. Uh, the drug companies, it's a very structured standard market. And we have had potential drug solutions for most common infectious and neglected diseases for a while. There are some neglected diseases where the only molecules that are available are 50, 60 years ago, and not much has happened in that space. Uh, so I think, and again, you know, from a production point of view, it's a very mature market. Uh, it's, there is one problem that has happened, which if anybody wants to take on, it's fake drugs. So there's a significant portion. Every time I'm traveling, I just go to medical. Uh, you can go to a pharmacist and ask them anything and they will give it to you. And it's interesting from a research point of view. Uh, and then you can see, uh, and there have been several sets of projects uh, associated with how do you quickly tell and detect fake drugs. So I think that part is uh, problematic, uh, but I would say for most, there is one problem in which I think neither the diagnosis and the drug hasn't uh, scaled, uh, snake bites. So snake bites is one that's really tricky because the sets of solutions, uh, just you need to have it and you need to stock it. And there is a complex kind of a scenario and thinking about how do you really build those reagents? And we can talk about snake bites for a whole uh, class, actually, if people are interested. Uh, but I would argue that I think we are far behind in diagnostics as compared to, I think dengue is a tricky one uh, that there is no treatment per se for dengue currently, other than just give water to a person, give saline. So there are big holes in which you could say, oh, if I had a solution for that, that would be tremendous. But we also don't have any good diagnostics for dengue rapidly. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. Something that will look and feel and package exactly like a real drug. It's not even sugar. Sometimes it's bad stuff. But if it was sugar... I mean, it's bad too, but an entire industry is created. And again, you know, it's a, we have to fight this with technology in some sense. So how do you authenticate drugs? Is there a very cheap way that a pill that you're about to hold 
know that it's aspirin. And actually, it's done a lot for aspirin and many other things because uh, when they get caught, you want to make sure that there is no real big detrimental. So you go for high volume drugs that uh, are kind of supportive drugs in some sense, but malaria, for example, there's a massive amount of fake drugs for malaria. Uh, a lot of that is just you know bad actors, but unless you have a technical way to associate and remove those bad actors, uh, it become, and again, you know, one really beautiful project that was done uh, is actually, there is a process called microencapsulation where you take a drug and you encapsulate them into tiny little particles that are 100, 150 microns. That process is very difficult to do properly. So the industrial infrastructure needed to do that can't just be replicated. And so there's somebody who did a project just using Foldscopes uh, they built a system for detecting all the drugs that have, they're not doing chemical composition, but they are testing whether the drug was actually made using this microencapsulation process. So it was kind of this very interesting intermediate ground that you can at least validate one part of the process. Yes. Yes. Everything, everything is exactly the same. I mean, drugs are also sold just as in plastic bags. I got some from Senegal this time, actually, in one of the markets where it was uh, just a plastic bag with a cocktail of five or so different things that you might want when you have a headache. And so, you know, I mean, you know, I think it's just, you have to understand if you don't make stuff accessible, what are people gonna do? And so other things will flood in. It's, it's almost kind of as a responsibility but you can't just even also say that, oh, there shouldn't be a second market for something like this because if people are not getting, the, the pressure and the force is just so strong. Uh, and so a lot of like, you know, mental health related drugs are just not accessible at all. So then there are black markets, there are other kinds of markets that evolve and people take advantage of that. So I think, I mean, this is a trade-off. Uh, one thing we can, I mean, your talk was a great example of that. You know, if you don't have that bag, what are you going to do? I mean, this, you're going to cut a, a container and you can put something together on a belt. And so I often think about if it's, it's almost a symptom of the, if you can bring certain sets of scenarios to the table. And again, you know, the legal frameworks are important in this case. Uh, uh, but I mean, it's a massive problem. And again, you know, because we don't have surveillance technologies, you can't do mass spec at a large scale, we can't actually say how big a problem it is because it's not as if we have an infrastructure around the world to see how many pharmacies actually cut it. And the pharmacists don't know this. It's not as if they are, it just arrives in the same sets of bags. It's like, oh, there was another dealer that was another dealer that was another dealer. Tons of things like these happened for masks. There were lots of fake masks around uh, COVID time. So it, it just, you know, it's common. Okay. So I think uh, maybe I'll just say one word about Liberia. Uh, it's important. I think Hope had identified this a little bit. Uh, but one of the challenges to just think about is just the breadth of infectious diseases that are present. Uh, it's astounding to think about. Uh, and often, you know, I could ask you all just in your spare time or on Discord, write down how many infectious diseases from the top of your head. I don't know, do people wanna do that exercise? Just take a moment. Actually, let's take a break. Uh, uh, I wanna see how large could that list be. Without looking at any Google or anything, take a pencil and a paper and write down how many infectious diseases you can name uh, as a game. Uh, you can use your phones, but you can't use your phone to search for. Uh, just type, uh, this is a fun exercise for everybody online. Uh, and I want to see some strange diseases that you actually know about. Oh, if you are an infectious disease doctor, then I'm expecting like a long, long list. Uh, so Mernal, I'm looking at you. Uh, so just just take a moment. Uh, tell me some numbers and you guys can start shouting some names of the unusual diseases that you might know about. Uh, I'll give you guys all a minute. And then anybody who has a long enough list and you want to volunteer, just raise your hand and we'll kind of go through. 
it doesn't have to be that you've been exposed to it or you've lived in areas. It's just you've heard about it. Uh, if you traveled, you thought like, oh, I should check whether. Uh, I haven't done this exercise, so I'm I'm thinking in my head, what is my guess uh, of the number of uh, diseases that you guys will cross? It's, it's, yeah, it's hard to say. I guess it will be very dependent on your travel histories. Okay, so maybe people can start shouting some unusual diseases or infectious agents uh, that others might not have heard of. So I don't know, anybody, you guys can just choose uh, certain sets of things, just shout out. How many did people get? I'm just curious as numbers. 10-ish? Six, seven, yeah, six or seven, yeah. How many did people get online in the chat that you can write? Uh, What's, oh, Ibrahim, did you get 60? <laughs> oh, no, he was probably referring to something else. 60, that's actually, I mean, if it is 60, that's pretty impressive. Uh, uh, I see Pawan's list, uh, 8 to 10, I think, is an average number. Uh, yeah, any unusual names that come to mind? Things that you might think that your colleagues might not have heard of? What's the most unusual on your list? People can just go around. I'm just curious if we end up finding some names that others might not have heard of. Yellow fever, yeah, that's a good one. The yellow fever vaccines is something that becomes essential. Uh, other names? Rabies? Yeah. Massive problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes? Yeah, yeah. Any anybody else online? Uh, I saw leptospirosis, uh, hepatitis, schistosomiasis. Uh, a lot of you know. I think there is an entire space of what is called neglected tropical diseases, which is just stuff that you know. Just because if you don't live in that geography, you don't get exposed to. If you don't get exposed to, you don't think about. Uh, the point of this exercise was, uh, I hear I see a chikungunya. I always like that name. Um, I think one of the threads in all of this is there is history of diseases, but what we are facing is completely new pathogens that are starting to show up that had previously only been reported once a while in human populations. And uh, I literally just sent Hope a paper last night that I was reading. Uh, actually, I should pull that up. It's, uh, it's a fascinating paper because it analyzes uh, uh, the list associated with abundance. Oh, is that on the journal club, right? Uh, here. Uh, so this is ecological impact and changes based on climate change in terms of zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. Uh, and one of the important aspects of this is associated with the fact uh, that people are only now starting to build and design. I just want to show you a, a figure around. Uh, uh, as the environment changes, what you think that you could be exposed to or places where you live is also starting to change. But I think this is kind of another key example for why diagnostics as a pillar needs to be a fundamental pillar of our healthcare system. Uh, because it's not just traditional context around uh, what people could get exposed to. There will also be massive changes. And those sets of changes is not what a healthcare system is essentially used to. And so the, like Zika was a, example for something like that. We didn't have Zika transmission. And I don't know how many of you know this, that uh, after 25 years, there is malaria transmission, pure, complete transmission happening in US now. So it's more than 25 or so cases so far. 
And that's really rare for people to think about because people thought that, oh, we kicked out malaria a long time ago. Uh, in California, there is a mosquito vector that is completely capable of transmitting malaria. Uh, and it's just something that you don't take for, I mean, we take for granted because just there is no transmission here. You wouldn't think, but as long as, as certain sets of things change, most of these things and diseases also have a tendency to coming back. Uh, I think uh, what this reminded me of in Liberia, we spent a lot of time just trying to understand uh, certain aspects around what infrastructure for Ebola testing is there. And it's remarkable to see that in some of the centralized facilities, uh, some infrastructure remained, a lot of it was dismantled because people left and said, okay. While at that same time, if you look in, you can check when the last case was detected. You can do the same thing for Lhasa, some of these fairly deadly diseases that are incredibly infectious. You can look through, there are these reports uh, in the context of potential pandemics of just all the time there are reports around the world for diseases that have just been kept on the brim uh, but will pop out. Much of this is attributed to a tremendous amount of deforestation uh, because you are in a space in which other uh, animals were the primary host and then the vectors decide to choose you over that animal because now that, uh, that has gone down effectively. So, you know, I think much of this is deeply related to ecology. Uh, but one thing that we've been thinking about in this space is this idea of building general purpose programmable diagnostic tests. So, you know, of course, RDTs is very powerful, but the, the, the reason that I really love molecular tests is a potential that you can rapidly use the same pro platform to deliver 10, 50, 100 different tests. And I think this is kind of our point on thinking a lot about these lamp assays. So I'll just say a few words on, I think you all heard a little bit on the manufacturing side, but this is the broader vision associated with it, is this notion that could you potentially make all the biologics, all the gadgetry in a local context? And I don't mean people making tests in their garages, that's an absolute no-no from a quality point of view, but this notion that our manufacturing capacity and distributed capacity for diagnostics has never been uh, scaled in a manner. So much of it is all centralized. And how do you change that? And what does a minimum ISO manufacturing facility look like? And the backstory of this project is for six, seven years before COVID, uh, I had a grad student in the lab, George Courier, and George and I had been working on malaria lamp assays to detect all five species of malaria. And we did a lot of work. That assay was still quite electronic. It had all the electronics, bells and whistles. We got it to a point where it's still very compact. It's still very valuable and useful, but it still relied on a cartridge, which was this little chip and a device that runs the test. And so kind of when COVID came along, I started thinking about this notion that I wanna break this paradigm of that you have a device and you have a cartridge, the device ends up being expensive, it's the one that becomes and makes it centralized, it requires batteries, while RDTs, the real power is you can pull them anywhere and you can run a test anywhere. Uh, and so that kind of merged in a manner to launch uh, what we then call SnapDX. Uh, and more and more as we progress, we started realizing that we actually do have a capacity for you know, in the same complexity of the object that I'm holding in my hand, uh, could you build and manufacture all processes that would lead to a molecular test? Uh, and I think that's SnapDX. You all built some of it. We can run some of these tests. If people get excited about a specific disease that they want to look at, I would be super happy on porting because we're starting to now explore a very broad number of diseases in our portfolio. So if some of you are choosing a diagnostic project and it turns out that there is actually a known molecular marker, uh, it would be interesting to kind of, because we built this as a platform. Uh, and so we can do many different things once we can modify the sets of scenario. So the history of this project actually literally begins in this room. So it's a little bit ironic uh, because uh, we started thinking about this and uh, we asked ourselves this question, could we manufacture a molecular test uh, that doesn't require any electricity, 
could be as simple as running an RDT. It's not as simple as RDT, frankly. We still have a long way to go. RDT is you just drop something and you're done. Although there are certain other steps that you do do outside, but in spirit, it has to be in that same framework. Uh, and it had to be at that time in the same price range of th thinking about, could you bring a cost of a molecular test around a dollar, a dollar per test? That's kind of one of the big framing is effectively the current sets of, uh, even many of the molecular tests that are out there, the cartridges can still range from 10 to $50 per test. So that just is not viable when you're starting to think about larger scale deployment. And again, you know, I think now I do believe that the costs can even go further down. So uh, you all played with this tool, but just some design criteria around here are kind of borrowing around this principle that all ballpoint pens have a cartridge inside and the cartridge is what determines what the pen writes. There's actually a tiny little glass capillary in it that has all the reagents that are loaded. And so all the primers and the enzymes can be kept separately. And when you are about to ship or when you're about to confirm that this object is going to do this test, that's the cartridge that you load. Uh, the other principle inside here is that there are multiple chambers. So many of you built the number of chambers. So I'm assuming you vaguely understand the architecture. Uh, there is the first chamber right here. There's a second chamber right there. There is a third chamber that's inside the tube. And then there is another separator that creates a chamber in the top of the tube. And then the glass capillary itself is a chamber. Something that we haven't played too much with, but you can then load multiple glass capillaries to run multiple tests. Because effectively, people don't want to know what disease they don't have. They want to know what they have. And so sometimes one of the challenges in this is that you must run actually multiple tests. And so if it's the same sample, potentially you have the chance of running multiple tests in multiple capillaries. So that's all I want to say around the tool, but I'll just tell you kind of some of the story around this, which is something that uh, we now better appreciate. Uh, in this room and in the room right next door, we essentially asked for volunteers, roughly around 25 people just like you volunteered, and we built this entire uh, kind of a force of nature on this campus to make 10,000 of these tests because we were trying to really test this idea uh, that could you actually manufacture at scale the sets of processes. Uh, so a couple of lessons in diagnostics that we learned along the way that are translatable. The first one is the design of how a person uses the test is as important as all the other technical things. Often this is the last thing that you think about. This is true for all your projects. How somebody will use your water filter properly is as important as the most important other decision that you would make. Because if they screw it upside down and then they think they've been drinking water clean for the longest while, that's a disaster. In diagnostics, that happens quite a lot. A tool being used the wrong way. I mean, if you're talking about a bag and if a person is supposed to, this idea that how do you instruct people with no, you are not present in the room, you're not watching. And for a lot of things that we're thinking about for molecular tests, this has been one of the issues, is that are the tests being run properly? Do you have the right set of controls built in? Uh, so this IFU changed uh, a lot of work done by Anesta and Rebecca in the lab. Uh, this IFU probably changed 20 times. Uh, like even very subtle words that we had to come up with. We translated this in English and Spanish. And we couldn't say the same thing in Spanish, so we had to think completely differently of how to say that same idea uh, because it's just that term is not often used in the same way. And uh, we did this usability test with around 600 or so people, and we changed this three times, and the usability went from 75% to 95% people in our demographics, only while we were just doodling and changing this sheet of paper. So I very deeply appreciate now why IFUs and instructions for use are so important. The first thing that when we sat down in the meeting with uh, several of the folks at FDA, uh, they had this number in their heads like, has to be six steps, can't do more than six steps. It's like, where does that come from? It's like, you know, we have run many of these sets of things, make it six steps. So then we went back to the drawing board. It was hard because... I want to explain certain things. And it's a little bit artificial sometimes. 
So when you will read the IFU when you go home and look at the COVID test IFU, you might see five different steps are written in one step. That's because then it looks like you can claim it's only three steps. So anyway, but it's important to be thinking about reduce the number of steps that somebody has to do to be able to run something. Uh, I think that's lesson number one. Uh, lesson number two is really thinking about uh, ISO standards. So manufacturing in diagnostics has a very strict set of standards. Uh, and so the materials that you can choose are specifically limited to making sure that those standards are met. Uh, some of that is really around contamination. Just if your device slot itself got contaminated, then you are in trouble. Uh, there is a certain class of quality control that you have to build in and something. And we learned quite a lot in terms of thinking about quality control. The yield of the first time you're setting up any manufacturing, the yield of your devices might be very, very low. And that's an issue because that adds up to the cost. So if you don't get a significant portion of your devices working at the test at the very end, you must go back to the drawing board and the manufacturing side of the story because in the end, it's added cost per se. And then the easiest way that you find this is you automate processes. And I think there's a lot of stuff that got automated eventually in this process to begin with. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys this material testing palette and I'm assuming, uh, hope that's really on the overleaf, right? The supplementary file, you know? Uh, let me just show you this. Uh, this is another very important lesson to learn. And this is why I'm asking all of you guys to uh, get some materials at hand as soon as possible. Uh, we tested around 40. Is the supplementary in the main? No, I think I see the images, yeah. Okay, here it is. Uh, so one of the challenges was that, of course, you can get the reaction to work, but then you immediately realize that uh, the materials that you have available to you that you're going to be using in your device that are touching your reaction chambers are uh, what what you're building your device with is something that has to compatible to the reactions that you run. Often enough, when you run it in a biocompatible container, that's been done for you and it's taken for granted. But now you're starting to build certain sets of things. And so this is basically every possible material that was going to ever come in contact with the reagent has a potential of leaching something. And again, as you are making this database, it's not, you can't just go in and say, these are where trade secrets come in. So Eppendorf, for example, is, you know, we kind of know for that, but there are certain sets of materials. If you're, you wanna build a test out of a biodegradable material, you have to go back to the drawing board and do all of these tests of tests. Otherwise, you don't actually know. And many a times with the materials that we have access to, you have no idea what sets of things could actually leach out. So this is a massive effort. And again, in terms of thinking about anything on the context of molecular diagnostics, it becomes hugely important in a way of thinking about it. Uh, okay, the last lesson that I'll just say, and then we will uh, split is around uh, data collection. And a lesson that we learned uh, slightly late in the game, but we should have predicted this, was we had built a test uh, that was designed around using color. So readers, it's a colorimetric test. And so our users are supposed to tell two colors apart. And this was one of the color tests that we had done, which is a classic color test that's used in lamp assays between red, pinkish, all the way to yellow. And when you're here and here, it seems pretty obvious that you can tell the difference. But we actually ran a usability study just for colors. And then we ended up detecting that a significant portion of people in the population are missing these sets of uh, 
cones and the color specifically for this. And so, I mean, color blindness is very, very common. Uh, it's often said in, I think in males, maybe the number is as high as one third for specific sets of color spectra. So it's, it's something that we had to go back and go back to the design board, change a lot of factors. And then we also built an app-based readout to standardize that readout that, oh, the person, in the end, the test is run, but eventually if you could take a picture of it, that makes it quantitative in a manner that it wouldn't. Uh, and Anesta ran these surveys on campus, which was really interesting to see. The same color, people would put it in two different bins, different sets of people. So the, this nature of usability testing was at the heart. And if we hadn't done this, it completely breaks what you're thinking about. So for any sets of things that we think about now, we even do the usability testing far earlier in the process. Then when you have something done, you feel like, oh, now I can test with people that is it usable? It's actually the other way around. The moment you have an idea, you should start having conversations to see whether, and especially in health, I think it's a little bit of a less risk because you have more time. The yes and no can change over time. But in health, it's just you get one shot, you get one process, and then either the test was done correctly or not. And then those sets of data sets that built in, you can't rely on. So again, you know, I think when we are thinking about some of the diagnostic tests, we'll kind of talk quite a lot about usability. Uh, similarly, we've been having the same kind of a conversation around microscopy because uh, in microscopy, we discovered when uh, we train people on doing the glass slides, uh, many of you saw Inkwell, right? Anesta gave a talk about Inkwell. That's all driven by usability. We discovered that people in the field, it's very difficult to actually make a good smear. And so we were putting in smears that were not high quality and then the test fails, but you don't know what in the process caused the test to fail. So again, kind of going back on that usability framework becomes the key criteria. Uh, that's all I want to say on SnapDX front. I'm looking at the talk. I had said that I'll stop a little bit earlier today to have chats with all of you, uh, but I got carried away. Uh, we'll continue this set of a conversation and very specifically, at least for the groups that have chosen a diagnostics project, uh, We'll talk a little bit about and some of these sets of general lessons we can actually directly apply. Uh, any questions? Uh, anything before? I'm just going to choose maybe one or two teams if they have time to stay a little longer and talk about your projects. Uh, any, any questions on anything we covered so far? OK. Uh, let me just go to the list of projects and see which teams have. So in this group, I guess the clean water, you guys are all here except Henry is not. And someone else is also not there, right? Okay, so then it's better to do that when they're there. Okay, who else is here in the class? Uh, I don't have a good intuition for which teams are physically here versus online. I'm seeing, uh, Leith, is your team mostly here or online? Okay, so why don't we have a chat with you guys? Can you guys stay for just five, 10 minutes? Yeah, Jenny? Yeah, okay, so let's do that. And then who else? Uh, uh, I see Lucas, is this mostly online or here? Okay. Uh, so everybody is here except one person? Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, and then let's do that. And then the microplastics team, uh, Niam is... Everybody in your team actually, I don't see Niam. Uh, okay, we'll pick up microplastics later. Uh, and then ostomy bags, do you guys have? Yeah, three is good, so let's do that. Yeah, uh, okay, why don't we just do three for right now? And so the folks that are in line, uh, if you guys can just stay, 
if any of your teams. So the three teams that we'll just do kind of quick sets of discussions is around the cardiovascular diseases, the non-communicable side of the story, ostomy bags, and then shishto, right? Okay, so um, I am going to unshare here, and then we can just sit around, and then people can listen in on this discussion also, just driven a little bit by, I just want to make sure you all have immediate next steps. So when you walk out of this class, you feel like, okay, this is what I should do today. Uh, and I think time is a little bit limited. So uh, I'm going to rush you guys in the early phase so you actually have time to think. It's no point rushing when your presentations are due and then you're like, oh, I'm just going to make a ton of slides, which uh, is not the purpose of the class. Uh, okay, so let's start with you guys, then Shishto, and then Ostomy. Yeah. And then I'll leave this open uh, just if people want to join in or anything. And then uh, for the teams, oh, maybe I can just bring this wherever you guys are sitting. Uh, okay, so the first thing to do is walk me through a little bit on what you're thinking about. So yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't need to record anymore. Yeah. At early talks, I think we want to do cardiovascular disease. Uh-huh. And I think there's something we're thinking about 